On November 4, 1979, the United States was dragged, bound, and blindfolded into a new era of terrorism. Hundreds of Iranian students poured over the walls of its embassy in Tehran. With the consent of the Ayatollah Khomeini, they took more than 60 Americans hostage. A Montreal newspaper broke the news on January 29, 1980. The headline read, Six Americans Hidden at the Embassy, Safe. Our friends left. Three days later, Ken Taylor, Canada's ambassador to Iran, held a news conference in Ottawa. The story was worthy of a spy novel. Six Americans had managed to sneak out of their embassy while it was being invaded. With the approval of Prime Minister Joe Clark, Taylor and his staff risked their lives by secretly harboring the Americans for nearly three months. Finally, the six were smuggled out with false Canadian passports. The embassy was then closed for fear of reprisals. The six came back to the United States to bone-crushing hugs. They were Cora Lijek, Lee Schatz, Mark Lijek, Joseph Stafford, Kathleen Stafford, and Robert Anders. Whatever happened to them and to the heroes of the Canadian caper? Shall we find out what happened to one of the Canadians in that Canadian caper? Ken Welcome. Watching our man in Tehran, this documentary. Uh, that, it, what's interesting about the documentary is you would initially, by the title, think it's just about you, but it's actually not. For the first at least 20 minutes, it's a, it's a very sound chronological story of the Shah and his predicament. Um, from the ultimate king, the ultimate monarch. I mean, this wasn't a figurehead. He ran the country. Right. And then you see, he died an, almost a, an unknown man in, in, in Egypt. It was a, a saga that nobody anticipated. You get the impression, the doctor, had the Americans given the Shah back, that this may not be the reality. It was a revolution. And I think if there's one characteristic of a revolution, it's that it's unpredictable. So whether or not the, the US could have either given the Shah back, which they wouldn't have, if that would have alleviated the tension, I'm not sure, because there were many f factions trying to become the supreme entity in Tehran. It's not the, the Ayatollah end. won out. Sure did. The, um, yeah. the diplomacy didn't die with this event, but you had talked about how diplomacy really changed, right? Well, diplomacy didn't die, but now it has no rules. Look at the tragedy in Libya and Benghazi with the ambassador there at, uh, at the mercy of a mob. So it's now, particularly for the U.S., diplomacy is practiced in a dangerous neighborhood. Now look at this sketch. What is that? What, what is this? That's the airport. Do you sketch this? Yeah. That's where the police were, the immigration officers, the customs officers, the revolutionary guards. And we knew the airport backwards and So forwards. this is you sketching out an escape plan? Yeah, and then I'd go over that with the, um, with the U.S. diplomats. That chart there um, was followed. And unlike Argo, there was no interrogation mm -hmm. of the nature in the movie. None. Uh, well, they looked at the stamp and they said, oh, you're Canadians. And... You're out. You're out. So it, wasn't it, just... it would have made a pretty dull movie. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been like a, a very measured Canadian movie in the 80s. Yeah, it would, it would, it would have been. Did a Canadian make this movie? In this one? Yeah. <laughs> it's right. It's Ben Affleck. Let's just listen to Ben Affleck here. This is movie to me, argue, Argo is, you know, thank you, Canada. You'll see when you see why. It's about our gratitude for how the Canadians helped us uh, uh, escape and get our people out of Tehran. Ben's a really nice guy. He's a marvelous guy. In your mm -hmm. conversations with him afterwards, do you think he knew? Like, because everybody thinks Canadians are really nice and polite, and we are, but we are a pissy bunch mm. when we feel Americans are snubbing us. <laughs> so, do you think he was prepared for well, what we were going to do? I was sitting after the movie, and I didn't see it. Uh, I wasn't invited. Um, but I haven't been invited to a lot of things, so I wasn't too offended. And so I get a call on Tuesday in New York. I think, hello, it's Ben. I don't know any Ben. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course, how are things in Hollywood? I said, he said, fine. He said, I understand Canada has some issues. Yes, we do. He said, well, maybe come out, I'll come to New York, you come to L.A., we'll go over it. So when I said to him, um, you know, the movie's fine, but it's nothing to do with reality, 
he affably said, well, I was handed a script. So. He just made I, a script. I, I mean, uh, that's, that's a reply. But um, Pat and I were in Los Angeles watching it with Ben Affleck, and it goes on, and uh, it's pure fiction, Argo. Pure fiction? Uh, almost. Uh, with the exception of, of the six people being in, in the Canadian household yeah. and getting out with Canadian passports, the rest is a marvelous Hollywood fantasy. But Pat's entranced by this. <laughs> Suddenly she turns to me and she said, we did get out okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, Pat, we're in, we're in Hollywood. This is, this is real life. Did he screen it to you before or after the controversy? No, after, because uh, there was some consternation in Canada that... Yeah. I thought Canada was involved in this initiative. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time, of course, then there was a certain caption changed at the end. But I found, um, looking at Argo, that, that I had developed a number of skills. Um, one was opening and closing a door. Right. Because you... You did a lot of that. I did a lot of that. <laughs> well, you know what? It comes up all the time. I was wondering, what would you do if there was an, a knock on your door and it was Julian Assange at the embassy? At Julian Assange, I'd, I'd say, I think you're charged. Um, I'm a, I was a diplomat, and right. I don't agree, of course, with an open sort of, what would you say, diplomatic practice being held in the open. Right. And um, sure, there's, there's a case to be made for verification of secrets. The, the government has overdone in that aspect. And Assange, to some degree, I think, brought insider alleviation. But to me... Um, he he destroyed some of the very means which are important to get international resolution, resolution to something. So I, I think that um, Assange maybe can be rationalized by some people. If I would say Assange would come, I'd say try somebody else. Now, what if you knew that some of his charges could have him face the death penalty at home? Um, you can come in and we'll provide you safety. But essentially, you're under house arrest. Don't think that you're going to sit here and negotiate and pontificate if we offer you security and safety. Right. Um, so it, would, it wouldn't be like Halloween then, where you would just shut the lights off when you run out of candy and pretend no one's home. <laughs> I look out the window. It's Julian. No, no, no. Sa same for Snowden or different for Snowden? No, S Snowden, I, th I think, too, is, a, is another variation on the same theme. Uh, if, he's, if his life in jeopardy, is in jeopardy, mm -hmm. sure. But um, certainly not um, putting him in a position where he's going to use that sense of security to continue to either carry on the practices, which I find um, unacceptable in a democratic country, right. which so is a sort of a paradoxical thing to say, but that's, that's my feeling. You can have asylum, but this isn't a broadcast studio. Yeah. Stick around more with Ken Taylor right after this. All right, up next, yeah, he seems gracious and all that, but what's the least diplomatic thing Ken Taylor has ever done? I'm going to ask him next. <laughs> so back here, we're hanging out with Ken Taylor. There's a few things I want to get to, including anthropology uh, with Mr. Taylor. What is the uh, least diplomatic thing you've ever said to a colleague or counterpart? If you don't perform better on your job, you're going to be more or less transferred to Yemen. <laughs> it was Yemen. That was the place. So on a scale between stealing a pen or having somebody quietly retired, what's the biggest um, no-no you ever committed under the veil of diplomatic immunity? In the documentary where the Canadian embassy was asked to prepare for the U.S. commando raid. Yep. And uh, that is not conventional diplomatic behavior. Working with the CIA. Working with the CIA. Yeah, you got a lot of heat for that, it's, and from Canadians as well. Yeah, no, a lot of Canadians didn't like that. The U.S. had three CIA officers in the embassy, but they were all held hostage. And the U.S. wanted, desperately wanted, to mount a commando raid to come into Tehran, take the hostages out by helicopter. They needed some plans. I think to do something like that, you need some plans. You think, yeah. right. And that's what they asked us to do. And so when you're, when you're helping them with those plans, do you feel like you're the well, de facto I, CIA I, no, guy? I, I, no, because um, I, I, all the information went through Ottawa. Yeah. That's a pretty flimsy excuse. <laughs> but you had diplomatic community, pal. Is, I'm, I'm thinking this is pretty, in that moments <laughs> of grandeur, this is, this is, I could really pretend to be 
James Bond. <laughs> but then I'd really look at myself and think about what I'm doing, and I was thinking, I'm more like Mike Myers' as Austin Powers. <laughs> you do wear great suits. <laughs> no. You do have great style. <laughs> we'll play a clip of uh, President Jimmy Carter here. 90% of the contributions to the ideas and the consummation of the plan was Canadian. Mm. And the movie gives almost full credit to the American CIA. And with that exception, the movie's very good. But uh, Ben Affleck's uh, character in the film was only, he was only in Tehran a day and a half. Mm. And the main hero, in my opinion, was Ken Taylor, who is a Canadian ambassador who orchestrated the entire process. <laughs> Pretty lovely, right? Mm -hmm. Do you, um, do you and President Carter ever talk, get together? Yeah, we're getting together, in fact, early October, just as an aside on, on Jimmy Carter and Rosalind. And last fall, he received, both of them received honorary degrees at Queen's University. Mm -hmm. And um, this was great. I, we, we, we went, Pat and I, and it was a marvelous occasion. And Jimmy Carter is 88 now. So Pat asked him now, yeah, this has been an exhausting few days. Um, and you're dashing off now. I guess you're going home to planes to just you know, take a little re bit of relaxation. I, no, 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 no. He said, I'm late for a plane. I'm going to Haiti. It's and incredible, right? That's, that's his nature. And I'm sure after going to Haiti, he went to Africa. I assume that in public you have to call him Mr. President, but behind the scenes, do you ever call him Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimberly, Jimbo, Jim? I don't quite get there. No. I mean, I thought that's... <laughs> no, big Jim, I mean, maybe Jim. I mean, maybe I get to Mr. Carter. <laughs> that sounds What a pleasure to see you, bud. <laughs> okay, Thank you so great. much. Check out the film on my Instagram. A really cool documentary. It's out September the 20th. We'll be right back.